How could a multinational alliance foster cooperation and promote solidarity when its members differ in political and monetary systems, culture, religion, and wealth? One of the reasons the BRICS alliance was created is to give the underrepresented developing countries a better status and a voice in global governance. You see, there are 193 member states in the United Nations, and around 80% of those are emerging and developing economies. However, global politics is dictated by the developed nations, which represent a small minority. But with BRICS, these 140 states have a chance to voice their opinion by joining the alliance. Unlike the G7 nations, which facilitate only North-North cooperation among countries, the BRICS nations make it easier for countries from the Southern Hemisphere to smash that like button, just like you should if you haven't done so already. But no, in all seriousness, they make it easier for countries in the Southern Hemisphere to cooperate with countries from the Northern Hemisphere. Also, BRICS has played a crucial role in improving South-to-South -South cooperation as well. And that's why many nations from the Southern Hemisphere have voiced their desire to join BRICS. If the group holds true to its principles of inclusivity and cooperation, which puts communication first, then we see no reason why it couldn't become the alliance of the underrepresented nations of the world. And even though these ideas of understanding, equality, solidarity, and openness seem well on paper, instigating them might be a little more problematic due to differences in the alliance. To help underdeveloped nations get funding when the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund turned them down, BRICS created the New Development Bank, or NDA, and the BRICS Contingent Reserve Arrangement, or CRA. The NDB has a fund of $50 billion, received in $10 billion contributions from each of the original member states. In the coming years, they expect this fund to increase its funding to $100 billion, which will be used to fund infrastructure projects in developing nations. So far, the NDB has funded around 53 projects around the world, worth a total of $15 billion. The other financial instrument the BRICS Alliance uses is the CRA. The CRA is a direct competitor to the IMF and helps member countries ward off global financial pressure. Currently, the member states are working on a BRICS payment system of BRICS Pay, which would be the direct competitor to the SWIFT system. And during the 2023 South Africa BRICS Summit, talks about a possible common currency were thrown around. If this happens, then the dollar could be dethroned as the world's reserve currency. But as BRICS accepts new members to its alliance, with new members joining the pact, BRICS will need to find a way to bridge the gap between the different political systems. China, for example, has a one-party system which bases its policies on socialism with a few capitalistic exclusions. Russia might be a democratic federation now, but they were the leading socialist nation until 1991. The Brazilian political system is a federal republic with a presidential system. India, similarly to Brazil, is a parliamentary federal republic, along with South Africa. Democracy might be the standard in four of the five original members, but China is a socialist state with the biggest GDP and the biggest pockets, which could cause problems in the future. Creating a new world order when the member countries are different could only spell trouble. Inside BRICS, the religious demography of its member states is very different from what we currently have in Europe. In the Western and Westernized world, including countries like Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and all of Western Europe, the dominant religion is Christianity, with the majority composed of Protestants and Catholics. And while the dominant religion in Japan and South Korea is Buddhism, the second most popular religion is Catholic Christianity. As you can see, there's good religious hegemony in this area, which is why the ethics of these countries are so in line with one another. BRICS, on the other hand, doesn't have one predominant religion. Just like the country's political systems, BRICS member states have very different religions. For example, the biggest religion is represented by Hindus, making up 32.9% of the BRICS population. Second are the unaffiliated, with 29.3% of the population because of the socialist system in China. Muslims represent only 6.8% of the population, with the remaining reserved for Christians at 13.6% divided somewhat equally among Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox Christians. While tolerance and inclusiveness are some of the leading principles of the BRICS alliance, we have to admit that this group will face serious challenges when it comes to putting policies in place that benefit the population. 
religion is largely responsible for people's values. Having different religions in one alliance means people have different values. The challenge comes when it's time to vote and enact governing legislation. When we look at the religious composition of the BRICS member states, then the situation becomes very interesting. Because, as it turns out, religion plays a vital role in wealth distribution and generation. This figure sourced from Pew Yasa estimations based on Penn World Tables examines GDP per capita by religion on a national level. In it, Jewish people have a GDP over $30,000. Then come Christians with $15,003 GDP. Then we have the unaffiliated with $12,682 of GDP. Buddhists are fourth with $6,867. Muslims come at spot five with $5,305. And lastly, the GDP per capita of Hindus is only $3,365. However, when we take population into account, things begin to change. Even though Jewish people make more than twice as much as Christians, their population is very low. That's why the global economic influence by religion looks very different. For example, Christians make up 49.3% of the global GDP. Unaffiliated come in second with 22.2%. Muslims make up 12.3%, Buddhists have 6.6%, Hindus represent 4.9% of the global GDP, and Jewish people come last, hovering at around 1%. When we look at the BRICS members and the economic distribution by religion, we can see that the unaffiliated hold over 35% of GDP, Christians are second with around 22%, Hindus are third with around 17%, Buddhists are fourth taking around 9%, and Muslims are at the very bottom with only 5% of the GDP. If we compare the 2022 GDP per capita in these countries, we can see that Russia is in the lead with $15,500. In second place is China with $12,650. Then comes Brazil with $9,600. Fourth is South Africa with $6,700. And at the last spot is India with a GDP per capita of $2,400. However, not all of these member states have had steady GDP growth over the years. For example, Brazil is somewhat down in GDP from its high in 2010, when the average person contributed $11,600 per year in GDP. Russia, on the other hand, lived through its GDP per capita peak in 2013, when it averaged $16,000, which is slightly higher than its current GDP per capita. And to think in the early 2000s, the country had a $1,900 GDP per capita, which is somewhat double that of China's beginning. Speaking of which, China is probably the only country with steady growth since the early 2000s when it started out with a GDP per capita of around $950. India started at around the same pace, but their growth has been nowhere near that of China. Theirs was steady and slow from the start with only $450 in GDP per capita. The only country whose GDP per capita has remained fairly steady over the course of the past 20 years is South Africa. They started with one of the highest GDP per capita in 2000, around $3,400. They grew to a high of $8,800 in 2011, and since then, they've remained at that level, hovering at the $7,000 mark for the past decade. At the current level, BRICS holds around 29% of the global GDP pie, with China representing the majority of that, or 18.4%. Even though the BRICS nominal GDP in 2023 was only $25.9 trillion, compared to the G7's $43.7 trillion, when we compare the GDP on purchasing power parity, which explains how much those dollars can buy in each country, then we realize that BRICS has $52.3 trillion, while G7 holds only $49.2 trillion. Population-wise, there's a huge disparity between these two economic and political blocks. G7 has a population of 775.2 million, whereas the BRICS nations have around 3.2 billion, accounting for around 46% of the global population. If this means anything, it's that the BRICS countries have a lot more room for growth, unlike their counterparts. The one thing these nations have to contend with is the declining birth rate in each country. The total fertility rate, or TRF, is the average number of births per woman in each country. Based on this number, we can determine if the country in question is facing a population boom or a population collapse, which means the number of old people is growing significantly faster than the number of young people being born. The replacement level, or the average number of children a woman needs to give birth to, 
so the number of humans stays the same instead of 2.1 children per woman. How do the BRICS member states compare to this average? Well, China, thanks to its one-child policy established in 1979, had one of the world's lowest total fertility rates in the world, set at 1.09. Wanting to end the country's growing population problem, the one-child policy ensured China's population is aging faster than ever before. The government replaced the policy with a two-child policy in 2016, followed by a three-child policy in 2021. But it was too little too late. But why would the number of elderly people strain the economy? So what if a country has a few more old people? Having many old people is not the problem. It's the people who have to take care of them, that's the problem. If there are no young, working people to pay for the elderly, then the system collapses. Brazil's total fertility rate is set at 1.75, which is close to India's 1.9, which is the country's lowest fertility rate in history. Russia's low total fertility rate of 1.5 births per woman is also alarming. The only country that's an exception to this below average TFR rule is South Africa, which has 2.4 births per woman, well above the average. As you can see, with the exception of South Africa, BRICS countries have a negative replenishment rate. G7 is not in a better position, with their replenishment rates being negative as well. However, they do not face the major threat of emigration, where young, competent men and women leave the country seeking better opportunities for themselves and their loved ones.